Now to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. I'm going to read here from verse 11 to verse 14 or 15. <clears throat> so you can read with me. I'm using the New American Standard um, Bible. So it says there, For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in a quiet fashion and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary of doing good. If anyone <clears throat> does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person and do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame. Yet do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. <clears throat> An undisciplined life, doing no work at all. There's quite a few people in this country are undisciplined and who do not work. We've got so used to it now, we just don't even think about it. But obviously that's not the way God thinks. That's the way we think. And I suppose what we need to do is to start saying to ourselves, not everything we think is what God thinks. And it's worthwhile checking that what you think is in keeping with what God is thinking or saying. On this matter, we definitely have to ask ourselves, is my thinking in, in line with God's thinking? <coughs> Because this is God's thinking. They were leading an unruly or undisciplined life, doing no work at all, acting like busybodies. And he gave them, gave them an, a command and an exhortation in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in a quiet fashion and eat their own bread. In verse 14, if anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person and do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame. <clears throat> why, why is he so harsh with this, this, these people? Why is he uh, wanting to get at them? Why is, why is he so different to us in his approach to this whole subject? Well, of course... I think it's the reason is because he knows what the Lord wants with regard to a person's life. And what he wants is for us to work, to be busy, to keep ourselves occupied so that we don't become busybodies in everybody else's affairs. It's important, I said it before, I say it again, that we get a work ethic in our head and pass it on to our children, and pass it on to our grandchildren, and demonstrate it in our own lives. Let's have a look at what the Old Testament and the New Testament teaches in regard to work. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, it starts off very early actually. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. In verse 15 it reads, Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. He was there not to put his feet up or to lay in the sun or to uh, occupy himself in idleness. He was there to work. He was there well, it was, it, was, it was enjoyable work. It wasn't hard work. It was enjoyable work. There was no thorns or thistles or anything growing. Uh, the only thing that he would have to care for is that uh, the, whatever was growing would grow in such proliferation that they have to keep it in check so as the garden would remain a garden and not a jungle. 
But that was pleasurable. No doubt it was pleasurable. And the surroundings were pleasurable. Everything was right for him to work. But he had to cultivate it and he had to keep it. That was his job. That's the task that God assigned him right from the very start, indicating that he doesn't, didn't want him to be a layabout. He wanted him to be a worker. In uh, the book of Proverbs, let's look at Proverbs chapter thir uh, 13, verse 11. He says, wealth obtained by fraud dwindles. Listen to that, brethren. That's a very important statement. It's not the one I want to emphasize, but I do want to draw your attention to it. Wealth obtained by fraud, that is by lies, by deceit, by cheating, by taking advantage of others who are disadvantaged, by, by all the manipulation that the business world is into. We need to be very careful that we're not party to it and that we're not supporting it. But we need to understand that wealth, even though it can be obtained by fraud, it will dwindle. It is not going to be a blessing to your life. It will become a curse in your life. But he says the one who gathers by labor increases it. And it's not going to dwindle. Because you've worked hard for it. And you're going to make sure that you use it wisely and that you hold on to what you have earned. So the contrast is there. You get the easy way of making money, which will dwindle at the end of the day. Or you get the hard way, which is God's way, laboring to earn your keep. And that's what he wants us to do. In chapter 14, verse 23, he says, In all labor there is profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. <laughs> there's, a, there's always a difference between what you talk about and maybe what you think you're going to do and the plans you've made, but actually doing the things is a different story altogether. We need to move from talking to action, from thinking to doing. That's what God wants of us. And in all labor, and this might help us um, in that whole business that came up about some people not wanting to work because, or they don't want to take the job because it's, it's sort of beneath them. But if they say, in all labor there is profit. That's what God says. And I need some profit right now to provide for myself and for my family. So let me take what I can or what the Lord is offering me. And let me, not, let me swallow my pride and get on with just earning a living. And in showing my faithfulness in this way, God, not man. Now he may use the boss or somebody close to uh, give you a promotion or help you to get on they will see like Joseph when he was working in Potiphar's house it didn't take too long for Potiphar to see the Lord is blessing this man this is an intelligent man this is a hard-working man this man is really committed to serving me here and he puts him in charge of all his household you see what we want is everything to fall in our lap but we need to prove ourselves. We need to show ourselves worthy. And by doing that, by laboring uh, and doing, doing it to the best of our ability, and I might add, doing it for the Lord rather than to please men, that will please God. And God can use whatever circumstances and whoever he wills to help you get on in the workplace. There's an interesting passage in, um, in uh, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 9. He says in verse 9, He also who is slack in his work 
is a brother to him who destroys. Again, when you read this sort of thing, first impressions is, is this an exaggeration? Is this a bit too much? Slacking your work, your, your brother to one who destroys. Well, it's, it's not at all uh, too, too harsh. Uh, and the way we would see this is we, if we look at chapter 24 about the sluggard, beginning verse 30 to 34. He says, I passed by the field of the sluggard. This is the idle man. This is the lazy fellow. This is the one who would rather sleep than get up to go to work. This is the one who will put off till tomorrow what he should be doing today. This is that sort of person who really is just indulging himself. He really doesn't want to do anything. He thinks life owes him anyway. But he says, I, I passed by the field of the sluggard and by the vineyard of the man lacking sense. And behold, it was completely overgrown with thistles. Its surface was covered with nettles and its stone wall was broken down. When I saw, I reflected upon it. I looked and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Then your poverty will come as a robber and your want like an armed man. So this observation helped the writer of Proverbs to learn a lesson about life. And the lesson is not to be lazy, not to be not to love sleep so much that you can't, you have to be peeled off the mattress in the mornings and you give your parents or your uh, partner or whoever it is, uh, you know, heart attacks every morning because they're calling you for hours and you're still not moving. We need to just get up. If it's time to get up, get up. Don't think about it, just get up out of that bed and no matter how fuzzy your head is, you'll be all right in a few minutes. Just, just get up, get out of the bed, and get yourself busy. But you see how the fields that he was to look after overgrown with thorns and thistles. To his detriment, and maybe to his family's detriment as well, the stone walls are broken down. Things are not right. Here's the destruction. Life starts to crumble around him. And he doesn't know why. People get promoted above him. And he doesn't know why. Others are making advances in life. And he's not. And he seems to be going backwards instead of forwards. But he still doesn't know why. He thinks more highly of himself than he ought to think. He's not realistic about what he is and what he does or doesn't do. So he, he is a brother to him who destroys. In Ephesians chapter 5 verse 28, a passage that we've mentioned before, but I just want us to look at it. It's not 28, is it? Oh. 24, thank you. No, it's not the wives to be subject, am I? I'm not even in the right chapter, am I? 528. Uh, I, it, it, it talks about those who steal, let him, chapter 4, 28. That's right. Thanks very much. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good. Now notice when he says we must continue to do what is good, included in that statement about doing what is good, no doubt for others and for our families and so forth, is this idea of working. Working in a reputable job, in a job 
in which you can be righteous and in which you can be just and fair with people. That's, that's good. God, that's what God wants. That's why it's good. That's what he wants for us. It'll bring good into our lives. But he, he says there in, in verse 28, he who steals, if you've been used to taking from people to enrich yourself, let him steal no longer. That must be past. As a Christian, that has nothing to do with your new life in Christ. You cannot live in wickedness and be in Christ at the same time. He says, um, he says, but rather he must labor performing with his own hands what is good. For what reason? So that he will have something to share with one who has need. Now, not only will he be providing for his family, but he's also got to take others into consideration who have need and that he was willing to share with others the hard-earned money to help them in their crisis, in their difficulties, and to bring them on so that they will have enough for themselves and their families. It's not just a matter of, this is my money, I can do with it what I like. It is your money, and you can do with it what you like, but you're answerable to God for what you're doing. Now, the question is, Am I giving to the Lord with that money? Am I giving it as first fruits rather than as scraps? Am I willing to help other people with the money that I get? Or is it just all for me? Well, this verse answers that question for us. But here, Paul is laying <laughs> emphasis on the fact that people must work. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the letter he sent before 2 Thessalonians, in verses 11 and 12 he says, And to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your own hands just as we commanded you, so that you will behave properly towards outsiders. And that ties in with Ephesians chapter 4, 28. So that you will uh, behave properly towards outsiders and not be in any need. Either your need, you won't be in any need, but you won't be in any need uh, of... Uh, yeah, uh, any need for yourself and others will not be in any need because you'll be willing to help them. Okay, now he, he says, it, it, it's a very gentle passage. You make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. He's, he's not actually saying to you, now I wish you'd think about this, people, good people, and I wish you'd, this is what I would like you to be doing. He's actually giving them a command and he's doing it by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that weight of authority is behind what he's saying. So he says, make it your ambition. Do something about it. Don't just be willy-nilly all over the place in your life and in your head. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. I presume that quiet life is a life where you're not causing trouble for other people. You're doing what is right. You're not interfering in other people's lives. You're not creating a problem for the church. You're leading a quiet life. A quiet and unassuming life. Attend to your own business. Keep your mind on your, your work. Now don't get obsessed with it. Don't let it take over everything. But do understand that you've got an obligation to do the best you can in the job you've got. In 1 Timothy 5.18, he shows us that not only the Old Testament, but the New Testament uh, encourages this work ethic. Yeah. 
For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Uh, Paul had used this in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the, the ox not being muzzled while he was threshing out the corn. Uh, and he says, it's, it's, uh, the Lord wasn't concerned about the ox so much as he was concerned about the lesson that this gives. If you're working at something, you, can, you must be earning the wages or a living from what you're working at. And you have a right to it. And then... He says the laborer is worthy of his wages. Jesus had made that statement uh, to the apostles when they were going out and receiving help from people as they went out to preach the gospel. So both under the Old Testament and the New Testament, laboring with our hands, working, and working diligently, and working intelligently, and working to please the Lord rather than to please man, is the order of the day. All right, let's get back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. He says there in verse 6, Now we command you, brethren, he's talking to the church here, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life, not according to the tradition of which you receive from us. A lot of brethren uh, don't like to read this passage. A lot of churches have decided not to do what is commanded here in this uh, passage of scripture. Uh, it's just been forgotten about, put on the back burner, forgotten about, and uh, it all seems too harsh for the modern day mind and the attitude to discipline that this world has uh, at this present time. But he says, for those of us who want to listen and who want to know what the mind of God is, we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life. The American Standard is a good translation here. Other translations have who... Uh, who are idle and, uh, uh, and have words like that. But it's unruly. The, the word uh, ataktos, I, I don't know if that's the proper pronunciation of the Greek word, but uh, what, what it says, uh, according to Thayer, uh, it's defined as disorderly, out of ranks, irregular, or inordinate. Now, when it says out of ranks, He's talking of soldiers marching out of order or out of step or quitting ranks. It, it's, it presents a brilliant picture because I can see the, uh, you know, <laughs> you see all this pageantry in England where the, the Queen's birthday and all the soldiers marching together all in step, very impressive, and the band is playing and, and so forth. But... Uh, you know, uh, sometimes when they're not so well drilled, you see one soldier and he, <laughs> he's out of step with everybody. Else. He's messing up the whole, the whole business. Um, nobody did that in the, in the Queen's birthday, but it can happen and does happen, especially in uh, the junior ranks. Somebody is not in step with everybody else or somebody just leaves the ranks, doesn't support what's being done, just walks away and does his own thing. It's, that's what disorderly is all about. Now, these are serious matters in, in terms of the army. They're not minor transgressions. They can, uh, they can uh, bring reproach on, on the whole army and, and, and all of the officers and, and, and everything else, you know, they're, they're not doing their job properly and these people are out of step and nobody's doing anything about it. So we need to take it seriously that when, we, when the Apostle Paul talks about people who are walking disorderly, irregularly, inordinately, they're doing their own thing. They're not walking in a way 
that Jesus teaches us we must walk. So he says, we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life. Part of un uh, the unruly life, which he's dealing with in this context, is they're not working at all. And they're going about as busybodies. If they continue to do that after he told them in, in the first letter to work, and now, again, he's coming to them and telling them that they must work again. And what we're, what we're getting then is, if they don't listen to this, if they persist in being disorderly and doing their own thing, we need to take action. He says that they wouldn't be walking according to the tradition which you receive from us. Now that tradition is what Paul had taught them. It's, it's not diminishing or making less of the word of God. It was the word of God that had been given to the Apostle Paul which he passed on orally or in written form to the brethren. So it's the oral teaching or written teaching of the apostles. People who are not walking according to that tradition are leading an unruly life. No matter how minor we think the transgression is, if it's not according to the word of God, it is major. It is major. And we must see it as such in God's eyes. See it through God's eyes, not your eyes, God's eyes. He considers it major. You know, there's tradition spoken of in, in a number of ways. Uh, Mark chapter 7. <coughs> and it helps to make this contrast. Verse 6, he said to them, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, The people honours me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to your traditions of men, or to the tradition of men. He was also saying to them, You are experts at setting aside the command of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, Honour your father and your mother, and he who speaks evil of father and mother is to be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or his mother, whatever I have that would help you is Corban, that is to say, given to God, you no longer, you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother, thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition which you have handed down, and you do many such things as that. Now in that first part, when he says it is written, he's uh, quoting from Isaiah 29, 13. And it seems like the traditions that they were receiving from their forefathers were traditions learned by rote or repetition. Now repetitious things are not, uh, they're not it's not bad to uh, be repetitious. It's part of learning. Learning is, you do, you repeat, you repeat. Well, I certainly have to do it for me that way. I have to go over it and over it and over it again and over it again and again. So uh, until finally, somehow or other, it warms its way into my mind or my subconscious and it's there then, I'm okay. But it takes a long time. There's, there must be a hard floor there because it's, it takes a long time for it to get through. But anyway, one way or the other, repetition is, is not bad. Now, you, you see it in the Lord's uh, prayer. The Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now, you can use those words. There's nothing wrong with those words. What's really wrong is that most people use it repetitiously. And most people are offering that prayer to God in words alone. And you're near to God with your lips, but your heart is far away. You're not thinking 
What do those words mean? What, what, what is he saying here? What am I saying here? And there's that divide between the words that I'm learning and what's going on in my heart and in my life. The elders must have been talking to them, especially in Isaiah's time, about bring the sacrifices, bring the sacrifices, because the sacrifices uh, uh, meant so much to them, uh, and they must have been taught as to how they do the, all of these uh, sacrifices, and they knew them by rote, they just uh, heard it over and over and over again so that they, they knew it very well, but they hadn't put any thought into it. It didn't bring, draw them near to God spiritually. It was a way actually of getting out of carrying out the will of God. Well, I've paid my price. I bought this animal. And I'm offering it to God as a sacrifice. And he will forgive me of those sins. And now I feel good. And I go away from the sacrifice and from the presence of God and I start to live my own life again. You know the routine. Live my own life again. Do what I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it, and nobody's going to tell me otherwise. That's exactly what they were doing. But it's, it, is, it is a learning which does not help us. As it is a learning that hinders us from being spiritually minded and being connected with God in fellowship through Jesus Christ our Lord and in taking control of our lives and bringing it into subjection to the commandments of God which commandments are righteousness, justice and truth. So we can, we can have traditions. But these traditions were setting aside the word of God. Anything that sets aside the word of God is a danger for us. And it's wrong. It's just absolutely wrong. There were ancestral traditions a lot more than the Old Testament scripture. These were ancestral traditions that the Apostle Paul had uh, spoken about. And uh, look at Galatians 1.14. He says, and I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. Things that were handed down from generation to generation. The thoughts of men, either on scripture or on what to do in life and so forth. But Paul was... was uh, was well acquainted with these ancestral traditions. He was as well acquainted with them as he was with the Old Testament. And he had the mind to, 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 to grasp it all uh, and uh, to give it the consideration uh, that it deserved. And he was into it. And he was progressing beyond his contemporaries at the time. But the traditions Paul is talking about is not the ancestral traditions. He'd given those up. The tradition that Paul was speaking about in Galatians, 2 Corinthians, sorry, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6, uh, is the, the, the teaching that he had given them, both orally and in written form. And that we must see. Uh, there are other traditions like Colossians 2, see to it that no one can take you captive through philosophy and empty deception, deception according to the traditions of men. These are the customs of men. Every nation's got its own customs. Some customs are good, some customs are anti-scriptural and probably anti-Christ as well. But, uh, but we, we needn't be taken away by our traditions. And I'll say this, in Ireland we had traditions. And the way I had to approach these things that they do over here is decide, not, not to uh, 
just dump all the traditions. It was decide what ones can I live with? What are in keeping with the Word of God? And if those traditions were not in keeping with the Word of God, then they got dumped. Now, I think everybody needs to do exactly the same thing with their traditions of their country. We have become new creations. The standards we live by are not the old fleshly self-standards or the customs of my nation. The standards I now live by are the teachings of Jesus Christ, my Lord. But that's going to get me into trouble with my family and everybody's going to be against me and, uh, and we'll be ostracized. That's it. That's what you have to suffer if that's what you're talking about. Stand for the truth and let them know there is something more important than the thoughts of their ancestors and the way they behave as a nation. That God's word supersedes it all. And they need to listen to what God's word is saying rather than listening to what their traditions are saying or their customs are saying. So we mustn't be taken captive by these things. And we mustn't allow ourselves to be taken captive by them. Very important, you're allowing yourself. You say, but this is the way it works. You're allowing yourself to be under that custom and to be accountable to the people who believe in those customs. And you have, you're making a huge mistake in your life when you do it. You are not in the flesh anymore. You are in the spirit and you walk by the spirit of God. All right. Let's get back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Paul gives the example of the work ethic in his own life. He says in verse 7 through uh, to 11, For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example, because we did not act in an undisciplined manner among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. Young people, listen to this. Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with labor and hardship, we kept working night and day so that we would not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have a right to, it, to this, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you so that you would follow our example. For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. All right. So the Apostle Paul broke his back working at the tent making while preaching the gospel to them. He was working night and day in order to accomplish this task. But he says, I had the right to be supported by you, but I didn't, take, I didn't use that right we don't have to use every right that we have or supposedly have. He says, I wanted to leave you the proper example so that you will be without excuse in this matter. All right, well, that sort of um, brings it to the point where if we do not obey, Verse 14, if anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person and do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame. They had no doubt been given the warnings, not once, twice, three times. And now he says, right, if they continue in their stubbornness, he says, take note of that person and do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame. Often in, in uh, situations where there's immorality and uh, not just uh, idleness and, uh, and a refusal to work, but there's immorality or, 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 or other sins. Um, we know from 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that even if a person sins against us, uh, yeah, 1 Corinthians 5, even if a person sins against us, we, uh, uh, we've got uh, 
the task, or this was Jesus, sorry, Jesus speaking, I knew I was uh, um, getting the wrong end of the stick. Je Jesus speaking uh, in the book of Matthew he says, look, go to a person if they've sinned against you. Try and work it out with them. It's better, remember we talked about uh, uh, if, if somebody wants to sue you for your short. Well, before you ever get to court, sort it out. Because you don't know what's going to happen to you when you get to court. You don't know how the, the, the thing is going to pan out. You might be the one that becomes the criminal and gets, uh, and gets uh, a sentence rather than the criminal who, for some reason or other, was able to warm out of it and look like the good guy. So just work it out if you can. If you can't work it out with them, uh, bring one or two with you that you can trust so that everything can be heard by two or three witnesses and still you're trying to sort it out, you're trying to win that person back. But if that doesn't work, you have to take it to the church and if he doesn't listen to the church, we are to withdraw from him and he's to be to us like a Gentile, an unbeliever or a tax gatherer which was somebody who was in the Jewish eyes, working for the enemy uh, to the disadvantage of his own people. And truly, that's what a person who falls away is doing. He's working for the enemy to the disadvantage of his own people, the Christians. So, this person, we're not to associate with him. The word associate just means to company with this person. They have company with them. There, there's two places. I want us to have a quick look here. One is uh, Numbers chapter 26, verse 9. Numbers 26, 9. The son of Eliab, Nemuel, and Dathan and Abiram, these are the Dathan and Abiram, who were called by the congregation, who contested against Moses and against Aaron in the company of in the company of Korah, when they contended against the Lord, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up along with Korah. When that company died, when the fire devoured two hundred and fifty men, so that they became a warning. The sons of Korah, however, did not die. They, well, they didn't go along with their father. That's what he's saying to us there. But it, it, here's people. You're in the company of people like Korah, who is rebelling against God, against the people of God, against the word of God, and you, by association with these people, are behaving like them. Bad company corrupts good morals. That's why we can't company, because they wear away our resolve to do what's right. I thought uh, McKnight's expansion on 1 Corinthians 15.33 was good. He says, shun the company of the wicked, that you not be deceived by their reasonings. Profane discourses and vicious examples corrupt even those who are virtuously disposed. You've got to come to terms with, if you're accompanying with those who are withdrawn from, because they are now in the world and in the flesh again, in the kingdom of Satan, their influence on you will be to that end. And you might not, it, it, might, it might be you'd be strong enough uh, once or twice, three times or four times, and uh, no, it's, it's not having any impact on me. But eventually you start to get worn down. And your commitment is not as great as it was. You need to be very careful. Just be careful. That's all I say to you. Just be very careful. We're not to company with people uh, who are like Cora. We will only be pulled down uh, by them and with them. But there's also a one-to-one -one personal thing. Proverbs 29, verse 3. It 
In Proverbs 29, verse 3, he says, A man who loves wisdom um, makes his father glad, but he who keeps company with harlots wastes his wealth. Now, I don't think he's just saying he's hanging around with a whole group of harlots. He's, he's having a relationship with harlots. And by the time he's finished, he's had relationships with a company of harlots. But this was on a one-to-one. Do you think it was to his benefit? Well, he might think so, but it's definitely to his detriment. So we can, we can company in that one-to-one, -one, or we can company just being in the crowd and associating with them. And uh, we need to be careful as far as that's concerned. We need to realize that they are unbelievers now uh, and that they are working for the enemy. And in doing that, they're working against us. Even though we're not working against them, we're, we're trying to do good to them. We're trying to uh, get them to think about their situation. And we're, in our own way, trying to invite them back and, and tell them to come back to the Lord. But you always have to be careful. There's the danger of contamination. Always. All right. He says... Do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. And of course, that's what we need to do. The, the, the clash when the withdrawal takes place, uh, people are hurt, there is resentment, there's uh, all, all sorts of worldly reactions. We have to wait for all that to calm down, and then maybe we have a chance of just talking together and reasoning this out on the basis of Scripture with the hope that they will return to doing what the Lord wants them to do. All right, I, uh, I'll, I'll follow up this lesson to show us that they, this, this applied in, in other situations as well, not just uh, with regard to the man who was not working and would not work. All right, so we'll do that uh, maybe next week, Lord willing. I'll leave it there for your consideration and hopefully it will be helpful to you.